Stephen Duong, S-T-E-V-E-N-D-U-O-N-G. Uh, senior urban designer with AECOM. First of all, I know we've done several stories on mm -hmm. Hyperloop before, but yeah. kind of best synopsis, what can you say it is? Sure, so Hyperloop is a next generation high speed mobility system that revolves around the idea of moving pods through near vacuum tubes at about 700 miles an hour or so using magnets. And it's meant to move both people and cargo through the same system really efficiently and quickly on demand uh, to provide really high speed mobility across the state of Texas. Why is Texas even one of the places this is being considered? Yeah, absolutely. We get that question all the time. And as opposed to some of the other uh, corridors in the United States, Texas, one, it's relatively flat, which makes construction a lot easier compared to other regions of the world that have rivers, lakes, and mountains in between. Another is the high economic growth of Texas along with the high population growth of Texas. So those factors together make a really strong future market for a technology like the Hyperloop. And the third is the actual distance between the cities themselves are very appropriate for a technology like the Hyperloop. So the distance between the cities are not quite convenient for short haul air travel. And they're not great for traveling in an automobile along a highway either, as anyone who knows who travels along I-35 between Dallas and Austin, the congestion is quite considerable. So having something like the Hyperloop fits really well uh, in the distance between our cities. What are the odds that we would actually get this in Texas? So I think it's very high, actually. Now, the time frame is the question that most people have. It's, it's more of a question of when will we get it in Texas. So Hyperloop One has publicly stated they would like to have a fully functioning Hyperloop system somewhere in the world by 2021. But we would expect that to probably not be the United States due to our stricter regulatory environment than other countries. So you might see the concept proven in the early 2020s in places like the Middle East or India, and then shortly following after that, uh, see an implementation here in the U.S. But in terms of uh, the United States implementation of Hyperloop, we suspect that Texas will be absolutely one of the first ones. When we say shortly after in the U.S., are right. we saying five years later, 15 years later? Like, what is shortly after? I, I think know it, it's not specific. But. Right. So I think it depends on how well received the technology is abroad. So assuming everything goes smoothly and there aren't any major setbacks, I definitely think you could see it within five years. The idea is that because we don't have existing uh, laws that help govern a technology like this, it really helps the government to see a working prototype somewhere in the world. So if we can see a working model, whether it's in the, uh, a short uh, corridor somewhere in the U.S. or abroad, that really helps the federal government get their hands around the technology, craft up some laws quickly to allow it to be built here in the U.S. Yeah, and tell me about some of kind of the other um, kind of futuristic transportation things like the charging lanes and, and all of that. Yeah, sure. So in addition to Hyperloop us at AECOM, we're working on a lot of different concepts like electrified charging lanes. The idea is that for the moment, battery technology hasn't uh, improved substantially despite the billions of R&D we've been pouring into it as an industry the last decade. Uh, so because of that, range anxiety in electric vehicles will be an issue for the foreseeable future. And we all know that we're moving towards an electrified, autonomous, electrical uh, future. So to alleviate range anxiety, the idea is that as your car drives over very specific marked lanes in certain places, there's actually infrastructure underneath that road that charges your car battery as you drive underneath it, which, you know, maybe you put it at really key intersections, maybe you put it in uh, a key spot between Dallas and Austin, right, to recharge and top off your vehicle as you make that, that lengthier drive. Yeah, so the overarching theme of my story is just like the future of Austin, so mm -hmm. that includes, you know, a hundred things. Um, what do you foresee Austin looking like in 20, 30 years? Yeah, so I think Austin's in a really enviable but difficult spot at the same time for its future growth. You know, uh, most cities in the U.S., especially in the west half of the U.S., have basically been developed after World War II, and that includes Austin. And, and Austin is now uh, incurring rapid growth, right, along with other middle-sized cities like uh, Asheville, Charlotte, um, Columbus, Ohio, and cities like that. And the size and infrastructure of Austin really needs to try and catch up with this growth. But because of that, you're going to have a lot of people who feel that uh, changes in the city are occurring too quickly. So to actually uh, kind of negotiate those changes between those opposing, opposing forces is going to be really difficult. So the future Austin, I think, you're going to see is very complicated. I think it's definitely going to obviously get more dense and bigger. Uh, but because of the transportation issues and the culture of Austin, I think you could very well see a really fast adoption and comfort level with the public on emerging transportation and kind of smart city concepts, right? So Austin's one of those cities that you could see a combination where you have these major urban issues because of your fast growth, but you also have a lot of opportunity because you're a rising uh, tech sector in Austin 
to meet those challenges. So maybe Austin and uh, many in the city might know you guys were finalists for the Department of Transportation Smart Cities Challenge recently. And I think that you'll see a lot of those efforts go regardless, even though Columbus ended up winning, that would radically transform the way Austin is actually laid out. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Is there anything else you want people to know or you think is important to in our future? Uh, in Austin's future? Uh, <laughs> I realize that's super broad. Yeah, super, uh, not that I can think off the top of my head. Is there anything kind of a nuance that you want me to touch on more, like that would help you round down, round down anything? I mean, I think it's good to, because, you know, basically we're just trying to, any any sort of general timeline that we can nail down for, yeah. for loop for charging oh, or okay. any of that stuff. I, I guess I do have a comment I can say. It is not a specific timeline, but yeah. it's kind of my feelings on it. So. So I think that with all the recent advancements in transportation technology and kind of smart cities technology in general, what you're really, what that's reflecting is that there's a great pent up demand for changes in the way we move and live in our cities. Uh, the way, the model that we've been currently developing and designing cities doesn't work anymore. And so this pent up demand leads to really high levels of investment. So Hyperloop One recently announced a large fusion of uh, money from Virgin. Uh, you see that other technologies like Google and uh, Uber are really investing a lot into autonomous vehicles. And the reason you see all this investment is because of that pent-up demand. And this pent-up demand means, I think, that you're going to see a lot of these improvements come a lot sooner than we ordinarily think. This isn't something 10 years down the road. This isn't even something five years down the road. I think you'll start to see major changes within the year or two years. Just uh, a couple weeks ago, Google announced that Waymo, their subsidiary, announced the first autonomous vehicle fleet running in the U.S. without any drivers in Arizona. And so that's already on the roads, and the federal government, within the last couple of months, has passed a law called the Self-Drive Act, I believe, that essentially allows up to 100,000 autonomous vehicles being implemented every year by private companies. So you can see the legislation is catching up, and the private investment has always been there. So I think you'll see rapid changes coming quickly. American and Southwest both offer the short-haul flight yeah. from Love Field and from Hobby. Yeah. So do you think the airlines are going to be kind of getting involved in the Hyperloop thing because this is going to have a seismic impact on Absolutely. regional air flights, yeah. but also if, let's say, I'm flying overseas, I can get on the Hyperloop at the Austin station, yeah. wherever it's built, maybe by the airport. Head to a big international hub. Absolutely. So we absolutely think that will be a major impact. And our feeling of the matter is that short haul flights actually aren't that productive for airliners. You end up burning a lot of fuel going up into the air and then you cruise at, you know, your peak elevation for about two minutes and then you start coming back down because of the distance between our cities. So I mentioned earlier, the, te the distance between the Texas cities is really appropriate for something like the Hyperloop. It's not efficient for air travel. You don't make that much money off it and it's really inefficient. You could be, those airlines and those planes could be better served doing longer flights. And then it's too long to do a casual drive, especially with the congestion we have. So absolutely, we'd expect that this would have a uh, substantial ripple effect on not only airport and passenger travel, but logistics. So with something like the Hyperloop, you're allowing the state of Texas to effectively connect together within 30 minutes the inland port of Laredo, which is one of the largest inland ports in Texas for freight and goods coming from Latin America and Mexico, with the Port Authority of Houston, which is one of the busiest East Coast uh, water ports in the United States, in W Airport, which is, I think is the third busiest airport in the world by pure volume alone. So you have land, sea, and air all connected within 30 minutes and it allows the state of Texas to operate as one logistics hub. And the term we often use is that you, you turn these airports and these other infrastructures into super runways because a Hyperloop lets you maybe land in Austin and then go to DFW as if it was just another terminal as opposed to another city. I was actually going to ask that. Like somebody, let's say they're flying into Austin sure. from Paris. It's been a straight shot, but they can fly into Bush yes. on a straight shot on United or American as a straight shot. And then it's like your ticket just says, okay, get off the plane, get on the hyperloop. Exactly. Shoot yourself off to Houston or Dallas in about 20 minutes, and it's borderline like going to another terminal, at least a short drive into the city, right? And absolutely, that's the way, the way we envision. The idea is that the traditional urban boundaries that we have right now are largely based on the scale of an automobile. So 30 minute drives are kind of everyone's comfort level with long commute drives. And that is kind of what today has defined your major urban boundaries around major uh, urban dense nodes. So with the Hyperloop, your boundary extends really far out. So instead of having you know, multiple cities in Texas, Texas becomes its own mega region or mega city. Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston all become more integrated as one 
you know, urban metropolitan as opposed to several sep uh, separate metropolitan areas. Yeah, that makes sense. What, tell me why this is something you even got involved with in the first place. Sure. So, uh, you know, my training, I'm an urban planner and landscape architect, and thinking really large-scale urban systems has always been something really fun for me. And a lot of the work we do in urban planning, we deal on the city scale, but there aren't that many chances to deal with something really, really large scale across an entire state, especially with impacts as large as Hyperloop. So when the opportunity came up, and AECOM had already been involved a little bit with Hyperloop One themselves, uh, when the opportunity for the global competition came up to enter and see if we could put our hat in the ring as one of the leading teams in one trade, we, we all jumped at it. And I have a background in both design and transportation, and I do a lot of work in autonomous vehicles and smart cities, so it was kind of a natural fit for, for me to work on.